a significant portion, I think, of marketing investments, especially in smaller companies and companies that have limited budgets, is predictability, right? It's we have a certain bucket of money that we can allocate to do this, and we have a certain set of goals we need that money to do. Wait, what did you just say? Oh, uh, definitely can never see myself using Optimizer ever again. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another episode of PPC Town Hall. My name is Fred Valles. I'm your host. I'm also the CEO and co-founder at Optimizer, a PPC management tool. Today, we have a great guest. We have Sam Tomlinson, who is one of the deepest thinkers, I would say, in the PPC world. Whenever I have a conversation with him at a conference, uh, he opens my mind to things I hadn't thought about before, some really interesting data analysis. He also has some contrarian views, so he's always fun to talk with and sort of understand where he's coming from. And uh, he takes an, a different perspective, I would say, than most PPC practitioners who are very marketing heavy. Sam also has a bit of a financial background, so a lot of that comes into play. So uh, let's find out today what he's thinking about in PPC, how we can all do better. Let's talk about some of the AI that he's using, and let's get rolling with another episode of PPC Town Hall. What's your hesitance on influencer marketing? I just think the a significant portion, I think, of marketing investments, especially in smaller companies and companies that have limited budgets, is predictability. Right? It's we have a certain bucket of money that we can allocate to do this and we have a certain set of goals we need that money to do and when you think about influencer marketing one of the biggest things is if it hits yeah great you will likely do that the hit rate's relatively low it's not there is not the, the predictability and the ability to to forecast returns and to accurately plan a business around an influencer centric strategy, I think is tenuous at best. And most likely for most companies, it is just non-existent. So to me, it's like, okay, great. Influencer marketing is a great supplement. It is a great appetizer, but no one goes to dinner at a fancy restaurant for the appetizers. Yeah. I mean, I had a nice birthday dinner. The appetizers were pretty good. I could have uh, probably filled up on appetizers. You but can make I, a nice I, I hear your point, though. So, I mean, clearly, and this is why PPC keeps winning, right? It's because it's the most measurable, right. it's the most accountable. And, uh, but, but, but ultimately, I think there's also a little bit of backlash. And, uh, you know, are we spending too much focus at the bottom of the funnel? Probably. In, uh, right. And so we should be doing more branding. We should be doing more influencer, but it's hard to measure. So, yeah, it makes sense. Like that's probably the last right. place then that you spend your money. Uh, and I guess that's your point, right? Like if you're a bigger company, then absolutely some of your budget should go towards that. But if you have, say, a $10,000, $20,000 a month budget, then it's probably wiser to just spend that where you can actually measure it, continuously Correct. optimize it. Yeah. And where you're going to get, I mean, where you're going to be able to reasonably forecast it, right? Like we've had, but I think the other bigger picture of this is, you know, maybe people just aren't thinking about search broad enough. What do you mean by that? Like, I mean, I think every time you say PPC, right, people immediately go Google paid search. That's what he's talking about. Maybe a little bit of Microsoft because, you know, we have to pay attention to the company that has 5% market share. Sorry, I'll think people who are listening to this love you. <laughs> But I mean, let's be real. Microsoft is a second place company. That's okay. I'm a Microsoft shareholder. I'm very wealthy for them being second place. Uh, not really very wealthy, but I've done very well on that particular stock. Yeah, the um, stock has been amazing. What? Yeah, the stock it's has been amazing. Thing, I mean, it's been amazing, not on the back of its uh, Sir, Not on the back of Surge. And honestly, not on the back of Surface either. Yeah. Billions of dollars in, sur in Surface advertising for 2% market share. I mean, Microsoft is. I think the last product Microsoft probably won was Office. But yeah. they have been consistently very good across a number of different verticals. But anyway, we digress. But you're so saying think, us, yeah, but PPC think, is too uh, narrowly defined. I think it's defined too narrow to think, right? Like, because to me, when you think about it, like, well, search is about two things, right? It's about answer discovery and it's about task fulfillment. Well, how task fulfillment i think is the part that everyone's pretty clear about like we do branded search we have product specific search we have etc right but there's this whole ocean of queries that people 
are going to different places and search is kind of unbundling itself, right? You've got more and more people searching on YouTube now. YouTube University is a real thing and it's a great thing. That's paid search. You get in front of people who are looking for X, Y, or Z or have A, B, or C problem, that's paid search. TikTok is one of the most popular search engines among those under the age of 28. That's paid search, right? Amazon, number one shopping search engine on the planet. That's paid search. Those are all paid search. They look different and they function different, but they're all paid search, right? Same thing for retail media, right? Fastest to, you know, one of the fastest growing segments of the advertising world in terms of dollars invested year over year is retail media. That's all paid search. It looks different and functions different and seems different, but fundamentally it is paid search. And when you think about it, it's like, okay, well, maybe paid search marketers just need to think a little bigger outside of the Google box and say, well, where are people actually going? How are people getting the answers they want? And how do I participate in that in a way that's helpful to my company or my brand or my client? And so at Warshawski, your agency, how do you act on that? So, and because you said Microsoft 5% market share, I think in the US, yeah. it's actually a little bit bigger. Oh, um, good job, Microsoft. Give them some credit, but, but still, I mean, we're Okay, I'm sorry, about... 8%, 8%, 8%. Oh, okay. oh. So, uh, oh boy. And then you got TikTok and then you got Amazon. Amazon's fairly big, right? So especially right. if you're selling product. But, uh, but how do you make decisions on where are you going to invest? And then the other thing that we see is because Google's been around so long and people have their processes mm -hmm. and workflows and they have their tool sets and they have their APIs and their scripts, like you can like scale these campaigns really easily, but then you get into something a little bit newer that maybe doesn't have that great API, doesn't have a great tool set around it. Um, is, is it worth the effort? Sometimes. I mean, so I think for where we think about it, you know, I think, a, well, a big part of what we've done and a big part of what I've tried to instill in people is for a long time, paid search has been about marketing to keywords, right? We've been so obsessed with keywords and it's like, well, behind every keyword is a person and behind every, every person is doing this for a reason. No one goes to Google and searches for something out of the fun of it. You do it for a purpose. And I think if you start to, when you think about budget allocation, when you think about strategy allocation, when you think about it, is it worth it? Well, a lot of what we do starts with audience research, right? We do use, you know, SparkToro, we use um, Bright Edge, we use Moz, we use Ahrefs, we use focus groups. We have data scientists that actually do run like market research studies. But fundamentally, it's got to start with people, right? It's got to start with that. And if you start there and you see like, okay, well, this is how this audience is behaving and we, for a lot of clients, even do ongoing like pulse studies just to see how things are changing. Because you can start to see pretty clear trends like, hey, more and more people in this sector are going to this place. Okay, well, that's interesting. We might want to think about including that then. But when we talk about initial budget allocations and strategy, a lot of it's rooted in, well, where do people get information? Where are people going? Who do people trust? And what does that tell us about them? Sometimes the answer to that is do more paid search. And sometimes the answer to that is these people just really live on Instagram. So maybe we should figure that one out. And I mean, I find that fascinating because TikTok, um, I hear a lot of instances where the younger generation uses that as a search engine to learn how to do something or they go on a vacation. Mm -hmm. They're like, what should I visit? Uh, a very funny example recently um we took our au pair to hawaii with us and we were Ooh. literally five minutes walking from this little shopping center with a nice cafe and all of these things um and by day five she's like oh i had no idea that that place was like just down the road and i'm like well did you not look at google maps like did you not research like on the map where we were and, and it, it, it sort of seems like no they went on tiktok and they were like i'm in this place what is there to do and so if it didn't exist on tiktok right. then it just didn't exist uh, but but yeah. I think of TikTok as like this consumption of a feed, right? Um, but, but so it, it sounds like the videos live there in perpetuity. And the point of making maybe making these TikTok videos is not so much to be in the feed, but to be findable when somebody is looking for that. I think, that's, I think that's part of it. I mean, I have a home services client that we do TikTok ads for, and it's been amazing for younger homeowners because that's where they go for answers. That's their thing 
so yeah, I think part of it is obviously you want to whatever go viral or with very low right. probability but that. Maybe win the social media problem. lottery. Yeah, and, 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 but I also think that's maybe the flaw in the older way of thinking. When we think about social, we think about going viral and like that's the purpose. But no, yeah. the purpose here is that people just do very basic searches and you don't have to have the coolest, uh, you know, the, the water bucket challenge or anything. Like it doesn't have to be that. It's just like, how do you fix a leaky toilet? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could well, get some business from that. Correct. I mean, um, I was talking to, you remember J.D. Crater, right? from Guara mm -hmm, yeah. and yeah, so JD and I were actually just talking and he mentioned how he found a niche video of a guy fixing a 20 year old HVAC system that happens to be the same HVAC system that he has, but this guy's wore a GoPro and, and walked through this process. And he's like, this, this saved me hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars because I was able to watch this video of this obscure thing that's super old. Yeah. But now if I ever need anything, I know exactly where to go. Like. It's a, and that's the thing. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you would do that search on Google, and if there was a great YouTube video explaining it, you'd obviously find that through Google. Correct. But you wouldn't find the TikTok videos. You wouldn't find the Instagram videos. You'd have to go into those channels, into those apps to yep. discover that. Um, I mean, I'm really curious about this home services client. So, like, what kind of videos are these organic videos? Do you advertise for them? Uh, we advertise. Um, so we're just promoting some of our, we do have organic videos that are posted, but right. It's like a, you know, window door, uh, window replacement primarily. Right. So we're just posting videos about, you know, anything from how to know if it's time to replace windows and like what that process looks like, the economics behind it. Cause a lot of times, you know, in many cases, if you're a younger homeowner, you may, honestly have never even had to think about this, right? If you're 22, 25, 28, lifetime of windows is supposed to be between say 15 and 30 years, depending on the quality. It's entirely possible that your family, you're in your lifetime, it's never happened. So you don't even know what to do, but now you've, you know, obviously with the larger macroeconomic and housing situation here in, America, in the U S you might've had to buy a house for that maybe didn't have updated windows. And now you're looking at it and you're like, all right, well, what do I do about this? My heating bill's out of control. My, I got drafts coming in, you know, whatever it is. And now you're like, okay, what do I do about this? Enter us. Hi, here's one. Here's like how you could do like a temporary fix. Here's, you know, what this means in the long term. And here's why if these things are happening consistently across multiple different windows, maybe, maybe you should think about getting windows replaced because you know, the, uh, the heat loss potentially is more than what you'd pay in a loan. So. I mean, I'm kind of curious though. But so, I mean, like the typical consumer, so obviously a homeowner. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, I guess you're speaking to frustrations of that homeowner. You're coming at it yeah. from the angle of like energy bills too high, drafts in your house, like pain points mm -hmm. that someone understand and then bringing it back to, oh, well, yeah. it could be your windows are not right, energy correct. efficient enough and then that's okay that makes sense yeah. now you're big on data and analytics right um so how no, do you yes. go about did, yeah <laughs> so how do you go about measuring that and, and how do you work with clients when they might be a little bit more of the uh the mindset of like oh did this video go viral like how do you bring it back to like what matters so i mean for us there's probably there's two ways we can do it right um you know one is for a lot of our clients we allocate a percentage of their spend to tests and we agree on what those parameters look like and what those tests are, but those aren't, those dollars aren't, it's, a, it's, you're paying to learn. So it's like, all right, let's, you know, continue to evolve our program. So, you know, like our TikTok thing has come out of our test budget. So that was easy. The second thing, honestly, for them is it's leads in the door. I mean, we're, you know, original source tracking is pretty solid. It's not perfect and it's certainly not the whole thing, but it's been a very, it's painted a very clear picture. And then, as part of our sales and intake process, we also follow up with like, okay, well, how'd you hear about us? Why'd you do that? Kind of like the, the team's actually legitimately good about asking questions. So props to them for that. And the data validates it that, you know, younger homeowners are disproportionately turning to things like YouTube and TikTok, even Instagram to at the very least understand their questions more because that's just the content that they've grown up. They've grown up on. That's the content they're familiar with. They're they're happy to listen to a podcast or to watch a video 
or to see a social post as an answer to their question. They don't need 10 blue links. Like, you know, oh my God, I feel old now, man. Fred, you made me feel old. Well, we, we I'm like, I, I do, I, I enjoy my 10 blue links. Thank you very much. I do too, but I also kind of enjoy the, the generative, the, the generative portion above that, that takes those 10 blue links and distills it down, uh, not Makes, having to click, not having to scroll. Like, I love it. Yeah. That part's been, I'm slowly warming up to that being a useful thing. Cause there are still times when I read it, I'm like, that's just wrong. And then I look at it and it was, ah, I wasn't right. No, 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 no. So that's interesting because I mean, the, the generative results on Google or on Microsoft, they, their job is not to generate from a blank page, but it is to take right. in those top organic results, the top paid results and distill that down into a narrative. Um, so I haven't seen that many it mistakes. Gets, in yeah, it got confused on time series data. Like if you ask for like, you know, what are market shares in certain periods? It's like, it was this and this. I'm like, well, that wasn't the question, friend. The question was, you know, what was market share in 2022 versus 2023? And you gave me 2021. Why? That was Yeah, so I mean, it does get some of that wrong. Um, yesterday I was researching iPads. I wanted to buy one mm. for my kids. And uh, I was like, it's well, it, it helped me understand the difference between iPad Air, iPad, an iPad mini. And so I was like, okay, iPad seems like the cheapest one. So that's great for the kids. I don't need a lot, but there's 21, 2021 and the 2022, like what's the difference? And it gave me a good explanation of the 2021, but the 2022, it was struggling. It was like, well, maybe it has a different processor. Maybe it has a better screen, uh, but clearly it was on an outdated model and it couldn't help me that last bit. Um, and so that's the other issue that we still see there. Damn SG. It's getting better. And that's the thing. I mean, think back to Google, right? When I started at Google, when you started advertising on Google, they would index the web. It would take several months to run a fresh index. So when you search for something and that landing page was updated yesterday, mm -hmm. like if you happen to be outside of the update cycle, you'd wait two months for that to show. Um, and look at Google now, like within seconds of something happening, it's on the search engine. Yeah. And so that's going to happen with generative too. Like we're, it's, it's already amazing. It's getting there. Good yeah, it's going to get there. I mean, I think it's, I think Google is uniquely positioned to win in that particular space, which is a very unpopular take among the uh, AI bros, but. Why do you think they're uniquely positioned? I mean, I think the, the biggest challenges with LLMs, right, are, you know, hallucinations. It's kind of the model becoming a little untethered. It's, you know, all these questions about, you know, what are you generating versus is it, is accuracy, right? Fundamentally. Who has the world's biggest collection of data that they can use to ground that model in fact, right? Who has the world's right. largest index of entities that understands the relationships between certain entities at a better level than anybody else? Google. Right. You know, who has access to arguably more location and business data than anybody else on the planet? Google. Um, okay, that seems pretty good. And then who also has, this is going to make the open AI. I mean, all the respect in the world to open AI, but like Google's AI team is amazing. They're, you know, these are the people that figured out Go. These are the guys that are going to win, you know, the next iteration of the gaming things. These are the people that built the transformers and some of the initial concepts that OpenAI turned into ChatGPT. Exactly. So they bought DeepMind, the company that mm -hmm. uh, initially beat the game of Go uh, and then AlphaGo. Mm -hmm. So that was mind blowing. And then they were the people be behind the transformer models. So you can mm -hmm. look up the research papers and then it's OpenAI that commercialized right. it uh, in the beginning for nonprofit purposes, but now obviously for uh, profit purposes. Yeah. Um, Everybody's a nonprofit, right? Up until it's better to be profitable. Yeah. I mean, I honestly don't know what, what was the reason for being a nonprofit in the beginning? I don't know. Probably some altruistic thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, and now Sam Altman is seeking $7 trillion to make chips to build the next models. Um, yeah. Just don't take that from foreign entities or all of a sudden you become a problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Also, um, seven trillion's a lot. Yeah, that's more than the values of Microsoft and Apple combined. So that's uh, not yeah. some change. Yeah, maybe like, maybe, maybe through in Google too. Maybe it's a couple of them. You probably could. Yeah, I mean, Apple's market cap's what two trillion, give or take. Yeah. They're all like two, three trillion at this yeah. point, which, which is amazing too, because just a few years ago, like we were looking at the first trillion dollar company and now it's just like, wow. Um, and just yeah, like you Mark, said, you really yeah. well on Microsoft stock and NVIDIA stock and anything connected to AI is, is basically off the charts yeah. at this point. What is it? The Magnificent no. Seven? <clears throat> is it? Yeah. Um, hey, but so like, yeah, I think the contrarian or not, I guess you have the contrarian view on Google going to dominate. And I, I like the reasons that you're saying. I mean, they do have access to all the world's information. Mm -hmm. And if you think of an LLM as taking that information and, and sort of the ranking system behind Google, yep. and then you feed that to the LLM to digest it for you mm -hmm. uh, and make it easier to consume and maybe have a conversation with it, like that that makes sense. But so I tried Gemini, um, which is their rebranding and- Yep, the rebranded Bard. Right, and, and that's the thing, like, it feels like rebranded Bard as opposed to an evolution on Bard. Like I've, I've tried it. I'm Agreed. pretty disappointed. It's not great on the text. It was actually solid from like a code interpreter standpoint. It did some good stuff. Yeah. But, so let's talk about that. So code interpreter, right? Like, and this, we had some fascinating conversations yeah. when we met in Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, but code interpreter was uh, open AI's uh, yep. plugin, which was in beta initially. So if you wanted it to write some Python code or do like uh, an MMM analysis or an audience analysis, you could use it for yep. that. Now it's part of the core GPT-4 model. It's a built-in plugin. Um, but yeah, talk about Code Interpreter and similar capabilities in Gemini and what uh, what's interesting I mean, to you. So to me, I think it's just a, a democratization of data science in an interesting way. That part's helpful. I think it's also just doing in some ways to data science what you know WYSIWYG editors did to parts of web development right you you don't need to be a specialist to launch a website obviously if you want a great website you need to have a specialist but if you just anybody can go to squarespace these days and drag drop point click go team and i think for a long time right the barrier to smaller to mid-sized companies using data in the way that these platforms want you to use that data was that you didn't have a data scientist like you didn't have somebody on the team who understood rfm segmentation or could run a multivariate regression or who could do any of this like if you wanted any of it done you know your best option was to pay a data science firm 100 200 500 a million dollars to go do it well small advertiser that's not in the budget so to me, code interpreter is just like, great. All of those tasks that were previously unavailable to so many people. Now it's as easy as literally export Shopify thing, upload to code interpreter, say, you know, let's segment this data and it will prompt you through the entire process of segmenting that audience. You know, whether it's, you know, doing an RFM model, doing a K-means, um, you know, doing a random forest, whatever you want to do, it talks you through it. It it democratizes data science in a really fascinating way. Yeah, exactly. And so even if you don't understand what those different models might be, the beauty is that you can ask it. You can say, tell me more. Why would this one be useful versus that one? What's the difference? Uh, how much data do I need for this one versus that one? Right. And it's literally like having a conversation with a data scientist, uh, one who's very patient, by the way. <laughs> and then instantly turns around and like once you've made your decision, doesn't have to go back to their office and spend days building the models. It right. just spits just it out. It. Uh, and I mean, you still have drift. like the what? there's still drift, like the model, you know, every once in a while it gets a little but you know, to your point, you can you can save them. You once they write the code for you, you can save that that you know, snapshot of that particular thing. It's a great this is and that's an important point, right? So, so it's going to generate some Python code for you. Uh, like you said, there could be drift. It could be hallucinating. So it could make mm -hmm. mistakes. So the output that comes out of it, you do have to validate it. Uh, and then one mistake that we've seen people make is they think, oh, next time I want to do a similar analysis. Let me go back and, and ask the same questions. Let, let's use the same prompts. But that's dangerous because you have drift. 
Uh, and Drift, just to explain to, to some of our listeners and viewers, um, but basically the, the model keeps evolving and the weights in the model keep changing. And so a correct answer today could very well be a, an incorrect or the same prompt could give you an incorrect answer tomorrow. There's no, it's not like a calculator where you punch in the same numbers and right. like it just it's, like uses the same yeah. logic gates to get you the, the correct answer. It's an evolving model and that's where you have to be dangerous. And so what you're saying is generate the Python code, validate it. If you think it works, then actually install it, right. save it. So you can reuse it in the future, uh, which also yeah. saves you a lot of the, the cost of regenerating the same code. Yeah, which yeah. I pay for chat GPT yeah, premium. We're okay spending some of Sam Altman's money. As you said, he's getting seven trillion dollars. Right. So yeah, exactly. So you're saying, I mean, basically pay for the twenty dollar premium plan. Now, now I am curious though, right? Because in the agency or like anything that we want to do at scale, like do you have tips and tricks? For do you use the API? Do you use Sheets plugins? Like how do you? Uh, um, I use the sheet. Oh, I, I use the Sheets plugins. Um, I haven't played too much with the API yet, but it's on the to do list. Mm -hmm. It's been a bit of a busy start to the year. Um, I still honestly use the web interface probably more than I should, just because it's bookmarked and it's easy, and I can just pull it up, drag, drop, say what I want, and it does it. I yeah. should use the API more. It would make my life easier. And now, uh, Gemini. So you said Gemini has a code, coding ability as well. And, and that makes right. sense, right? So Google has long said that they one of the strengths of their models is coding and different languages, mm -hmm. different programming yes. languages, as well as different like uh, spoken languages. Correct. But, and so have you tried that? And how does that differ from the OpenAI code interpreter? I think in terms of... The overall experience, the Gemini has been impressive in the sense that it's getting to the right, it's getting to very close to accurate, if not very accurate code faster with less revisions. Um, in fairness, it's only been, what, two weeks since we announced Gemini was a thing? So I haven't like, that's not a ton of time for drift, a pre thing. But it's right, been so good. like a mid February or early February announcement, depending on when you watch this. Right. So, yeah, this is mid February. It's been two weeks since we announced Gemini. And it's been, I mean, I would say it's been very good at the data science task. It's been very good at writing basic code. I've used it for like, you know, some tag kind of like triggers. I've used it for regular expressions. I also just hate writing regular expressions. It makes me angry. So. I let code interpreter do it, or I haven't met anyone yet who doesn't get angry at regular expressions. Terrible and if you don't words. know what regular expressions are, then uh, you know you're you welcome. Haven't yeah. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. To me, it's just been a very on the the code side. It's been very buttoned up. The code has been compact. It's been useful. It's been accurate. It very very few issues with it. With ChatGPT, I would say it's been 85 to 90% accurate. I think Gemini on the code tasks has been probably closer to 90, 95%. So to me, that was a big, yeah. that was a big win. Um, I think on the text generation, like the actual response generation, OpenAI is still, is still ahead there. And like you said, it's been a little underwhelming, but then again, GPT 3.5 was not great. Like when GPT 4 even started, it was glitchy, we'll call it, right? But the whole point of the models is they get better as adoption increases, as data velocity through those models increases, you know, as user feedback is able to be collected and used to either adjust or reinforce or remove parts of the training, it gets better. So I think. If you look at, I think it's a bit of a disingenuous comparison to say, okay, Gemini today, 12, 14 days post launch versus GPT 4, eight months post launch. It's just not a fair comparison. I know, I know, but then also I feel like, I mean, Google has had BARD for a long time and Google, like no you said, used it. Google invented through Google Brain, they invented the right. transformer. They've been working on this. They just held it back because they were too con more concerned than OpenAI about 
the hallucinations and sort of the things that these models could do and say that might be incorrect. Um, and kudos to Google for not trying to spread misinformation in the world right. that's maybe seeded by these large language models. But at the same time, I, I think it's not entirely fair to say that, that Google has started later. Like they just, I, I'm, I'm, but, but you make a very good point, which is, listen, if you need code written, maybe Gemini is great. If you need a blog post written, you might want to go to GPT-4. And I think that's one of the things that we as uh, humans still bring to these models, right? Is we understand, okay, this model is really good at that. That one's uh, pretty good, but it's also 10x cheaper. So if I'm going to do this at scale or through like a Sheets plugin, because by the way, now you have to pay for these Sheets plugins. for the Yeah, that's annoying. I don't like it. I want it free. Well, who likes paying, right? Nobody likes paying, but sometimes you just have to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, Fred, you know, I pay for Optimizer. That's pretty good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, so, and that's the other, uh, so for us at Optimizer, and thank you for mentioning it, but we do bring in AI into the tool because we fundamentally believe that people don't necessarily want to change their workflows. They want to keep working in the tools they already know, and, and that should have AI capabilities added. So if you need new headlines, Optimizer will suggest those to you. If you want to have a conversation about an account, you can do that through Optimizer Sidekick, which is using OpenAI's models, but uh, but it grounds it in the truth of your account. And we do a lot of the calculation to say like, okay, by the way, a CTR, that's clicks divided by impressions. Like if you ask GPT, 80% of the time it does it correctly. And then 20% of the time it does it wrong. And now you go to your client and you tell them some like completely wrong CTR. Um, yeah, you're you're getting fired that's that not day. not good. That's not that's not, not great, Bob. Uh, no, so um, so tell us. I, so you you brought up the example of Shopify data and bringing that to do some segmentation. Um, is there a cool yeah. example that you've done, maybe using Google Ads data directly? So something our listeners could try today. Mm. So I mean, I would say the closest we've done with that would be um, using our owned audience data. So say CRM data. Obviously, you know, on the Google ad side, right, it's the importance of your own data is getting bigger and bigger, right? We're, we're playing more and more with demand gen campaigns. We're doing more and more with some of those lookalikes. Well, I would say probably one of the, the cooler examples is, you know, we took audience data, like a whole customer profile, right? Used GPT to segment that into different buyer types, into different personas and cluster that. And then you uploaded each of the clusters as a unique audience which actually gave us much better performance on the lookalike segment, which was cool because obviously, you know, lookalikes, the more homogenous the seed, the more relevant the lookalike is most li is more likely to be. And those are quite sensitive to the initial conditions. So that was fun. I think you could, that's an, it's, a, it's an easy application, but it's a good one. You know, take your customer data, build segments, right? I think so many marketers just take all customers, throw into Google, go team. Well, you could add a single step into that process and get you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% better results in terms of efficiency, in terms of lower cost per lead, in terms of higher return on ad spend, however you're measuring that by just saying, hey, chat GPT, hey, Gemini, here's a list. Can you tell me, run an RFM model on this? Run a K-means cluster on this? Give me back something. Or, you know, the other easy one you can do if you have an e-commerce store is, especially for Shopify, all of your user data is in there, right? Hey, Shopify, give me this list without the lowest 30% of clients. Or, hey, Shopify, or hey, you know, GPT, Gemini, whatever. Here's a list of my actual costs, which is another fun thing you can do. Here's the people and what, here's the SKUs they bought. Here's the costs for each SKU. Tell me which customers were the most profitable. Which customers did I lose money on? What things do those customers have in common in terms of source, um, in terms of what ad uh, platform they came from, in terms of what their purchase path looked like? You can find a ton of insights that from like a paid search, paid social standpoint, you can then leverage pretty easily. Yeah, right? very cool. All of a sudden, and so... <clears throat> Go ahead. Sorry. So, the, I mean, you talked about code interpreter, right? But just to be very clear, anyone who's using that today, you'd simply go to GPT-4 and there's a little yep. logo for uploading a file. You upload that file. That basically starts the code interpreter ability. 
and then it uh, it has this little arrow at the end of the response. If you click on that, that's where you see the actual Python code. So this, it's not highly obvious what's happening, but that's where you'd have to click to see that yeah. it had done some code generation and actually used statistical models and actual programming to come back with an answer. And where it's always been a little bit um, annoying to me, and I don't know if they fixed that, so you can tell us if you know they have, but you do this analysis and now you get these segments, right? And then you're like, well, now tell me something in common, like search terms these types of people might have looked for. If that is not present in your data set, it, it, it has a hard time going from like code interpretation in Python to going back to the large language model right. capabilities. And so sometimes you kind of have to split up that task um, to get it all the way to where you need it to be. Yeah, that's a hundred, that has not changed. It is, okay. but that same task, right, would have taken a data scientist three, four or five hours potentially. Oh yeah, absolutely. Gemini will crank that out in three or four minutes. Well, and, and to your point that, uh, you know, people just upload their whole list and they should have done this one extra step. And I think that's where we've all just been conditioned to like that one extra step that was your half million dollar data science project, or that was like waiting five hours for the data science. And that's if you're lucky waiting five hours. I mean, like give it waiting a week for that data to come right. back. Right. So that's why we didn't do it. But now, now it's available for $20 a month and three minutes of your time, like having a quick conversation and, Mm -hmm. uh, and it spits out the data in a structured format, which you can then bulk upload back into Google ads or whatever platform you want. Exactly. And, and you're saying you see these amazing gains from it. So, so I think that's yeah, really, it's been, it's been very, very promising. Um, obviously, you know, we're still early on deep on demand gen. I think that's still been hit or miss. Um, but I love lookalike audiences. I think we're finally getting away from the, uh, the broad bros. So. I'm, I'm happy to see that there is kind of a, you can't just put everything on broad and YOLO anymore. Thank God. Yeah. Well, you know, audiences, it's uh, it's kind of a social thing, but it's in search oh, and it uh, works for a reason, now. right? I mean, it PPC looks reason. more and more, I mean, you know, paid search looks more and more like a DSP every day. Yeah. And like you, you brought up the point too that, you do these um, focus groups because you're, you're fundamentally trying to understand who are my customers, who are my prospective buyers. And that's a little bit the point that over 20 years of Google ads and being so metrics driven, like we maybe forgotten about the human element and the person on the other end of that click. And that's what you're saying. Now we can go back to that, but we can also layer that on top of AI, generative, do some really cool stuff with it. So I think that's really bringing it full circle. So yeah, I love all of that stuff. So Sam, um, why don't we do a couple of uh, rapid fire questions here? Oh, good. Let's do those. All right. So the first one, what's something you wish you would have known before you started PPC marketing? Um, honestly, how much I didn't know about creative like how important creative was to it. It's taken me a long, it's been a long journey for me to go from, yeah, 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 creative is like 20% of the equation to, oh yeah, creative actually is a much bigger part of the equation than maybe I wanted to admit. But, you know, you. Yeah, makes sense. Um, it's one of the few things you can still control. So even a bigger deal today than it was yeah. a couple of years ago. Uh, what's one common PPC myth that you would like to debunk? Oh, God, there are so many of those. Um, where do you want to start with this one? Oh, um, bid modifiers. I hate, I hate the misconceptions around bid modifiers. Bid modifiers and most smart bidding are not compatible. You cannot upload a bunch of zip codes and be like, with my target CPA campaign, I'm gonna target the zip code. That's not how that works with bid modifiers. You can target them, sure. But it, what? Almost all bid modifiers, except for minus 100% on device, are ignored by smart bidding. So whenever you put in something stupid, like, hey, this campaign that's using smart bidding, I'm going to use bid modifiers, all you're doing is wasting your time. So please stop it. Yep. One of our most popular blog post infographics, which bid adjustments are compatible with which 
bit strategies. Um, cause yeah, there's a lot of bit strategies to choose from and like, it's, it's kind of weird which ones are compatible, but for the most part, you're right in the modern day and age of automated bidding, uh, with these bid modifiers don't do right. much. And, yeah. That means, um, I mean, the, 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 this is going to have an obvious answer. So you're not allowed to say open AI or chat GPT, but what is your favorite AI tool and uh, how do you use it? Uh, my favorite AI tool. It's not one of those. Um, let's see. I have one. Uh, so I use talknotes.io. Discovered oh. that very recently. Yeah, do I have, um, I do know that. I have Otter AI, so it's just like, does the same thing for my Zooms. That's been a game changer. I like that one. So to tell people a bit more about what Otter AI does. Um, it just join, uh, so it joins all of my meetings, of all my Zooms, um, and it's basically just like a virtual assistant, and it jots that. It basically just transcribes the conversation and summarizes it in bullet points and sends them to you. So if you're ever in a meeting, obviously, if you're like, you know, back to back to back Zooms and there are specific details, you don't have to go back and listen to a whole recording of it. You can literally just pull this up. It tells you when a certain part of the conversation happened. You can, you know, read the, the actual, uh, transcript or you can go listen to that part of the conversation and just it, it's just a big time saver for me in the sense like i don't have to feel compelled to take notes and i don't have to worry about oh my like what what was that what was that number where was that list what was that file name whatever yeah and i think it's also brilliant with selective hearing which i think we all suffer from at some level right so um why well, you're making a face there, mm -hmm. like you don't? Right? I'm, I'm sure. Oh, I do. I, I 100 do that. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I mean, so like, to at the end of the call, it's like, oh wait, that's what the client wanted. That's what they asked me. Like that completely went in one ear and out the other because my mind was somewhere else, 100%. right? So yeah, I, I love other AI and that sort of technology. Yeah, that is a um, What is one important skill marketers should develop to stand out in 2024 and beyond? Um, I'm going to say the same one I've said for a while, which is they need to understand how finance works. I think so many marketers have just grown up in an era where there was the illusion of accountability versus actual financial accountability. And we're finally getting to that point where, you know, the, the marrying of marketing and finance is finally starting to happen. I think people on the financial side are recognizing the importance of growth and, and how some of the metrics marketers have can be valuable. And I think um, some marketers, you know, I think D2C has had to grow up a little bit faster maybe than other industries are finally starting to say, you know what, I need to, I need to get away from ROAS. I need to get away from the click through rates and impressions and clicks. And I need to start thinking about impact to the underlying organization and what that looks like and how much of that is incremental versus how much of that is not. And I need to start making better decisions because, you know, fundamentally, I think marketing is an exercise in capital allocation, right? Can't do that without understanding finance. Yeah. Yeah. And then some really great blog posts that you've done. These are a little bit older, but I think you had one on the uh, recession, like what happens in a PPC in a recession, you either put your foot oh, yeah. up or you like back off and two different outcomes. Um, so some good stuff. Where can people find your stuff, by the way? What's the best place to... Uh, website. Uh, so I'm on Twitter, which is usually the one I respond to the most, but I add a newsletter every week. Um, I think you read it sometimes, Fred. Oh, you see my open uh, when I open it? Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah um, you're, you're, you're one of the circled ones, but it's okay, uh, samtomlinson.me slash newsletter. Very original, I know. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes. Um, and then final rapid fire, you've talked about a number of platforms, but what's one of the more emerging ones that you're most excited about? I really like perplexity. I've been playing around with that one for a minute. That to me is a, it's a really interesting use case, um, in terms of, you know, how it's unlocking information discovery using AI, but that I think is a, just an interesting platform. Um, I'm also playing a lot more with retail media platforms than I ever have before, because I just think they're both fascinating and criminally underutilized. 
So that's been interesting because on one hand you have like perplexity, which is wildly advanced. And on the other hand, you have retail media networks, which are Google in 2014. Not you guys, but like, let's be real. That's the tech that, that's currently there. And it's like, you know, one, one foot in the past and one foot in the future. And you're trying to figure out how these two things come together. And it's going to be interesting. Great. And then we, we had one audience question. So uh, we'll finish with that. But it's uh, speaking of one foot in the past, one in the future. How do you make sure you got both feet in the future? And how do you stay up with uh, all of the latest developments and any tips on that? It's a never ending. Uh, I read way too much, I would say. I mean, I, in terms of staying up with trends, I think a lot of it is refining where you get information from. Um, so for me, that's been a continual process of seeking out sources that maybe other people aren't looking at um, and looking at sources might be outside of marketing. So um, if you know Benedict Evans, he writes a newsletter every week. I subscribe to that. 2 p.m., uh, which is Web Smith. Um, they write something on commerce and trends. It's more big picture. Um, quite a few financial ones that do you know stock analysis, um, trend analysis, earnings call write-ups, et cetera. So you can get some good info out of those. Um, trade clubs, search engine land, search engine journal, the optimizer. So speaking blog. of that, I'm gonna, let, let me let me interrupt you and uh, final mm -hmm. final question. But given that you're so into finance and reading stock blogs and all. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you buying today? What am I buying today? Uh, what did I buy today? Let me tell you. Let's find out. What did I buy this morning? And let's see how we do. Hey. Ooh, we had a good day. That's fun. Um, I bought some deposit, DPST, uh, regional bank ETF. And bought some Alibaba. Love Charlie Munger. Bought Alibaba around 68, bought deposit at 68. Um, and I still keep uh, buying a few. Still keep leveraging into Google and Microsoft. Just dollar cost averaging myself up. But cool. at so the end of the day, no it's going to be. What? No financial advice. This is not financial um, advice. Would, do whatever you want. I'm not okay. a licensed broker. Have whatever. Do whatever you want. Have fun. Yep. Um, but that's what Sam bought this morning. So that's what I bought this morning. Anyway, sure. and we're up five percent today. So I didn't do so I did something right today. <laughs> I don't play it day by day. It's just too depressing no. some days. And you have yeah. the other days, but like yeah. Anyway, Sam, always fantastic talking with you. Uh, thanks for sharing with our audience. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, want to see more of them, please give us a like, subscribe at the bottom, and join us for future episodes. Sam, samtomlinson.me. That's where you'll find his blog. You can subscribe to his newsletter. And he'll be speaking at many conferences in Europe, uh, some in the United States. Yeah. By the time you watch this, he may have already spoken, but he's a regular on the circuit. So look him up and... If you want to catch him in person, he is actually out there in the real world, which is awesome. Uh, I myself look forward to uh, mm -hmm. grabbing a drink with you yeah. at uh, Munich. Munich, and, uh, yes. Thanks, Fred. So uh, we'll see you for the next one.